designs, overall designs for research, we have a number of them here. They're all valid. They all have different applications and different values. So experimental designs are ones where we can randomly assign people to groups. Now, I do have to make a, a distinction here. Random assignment is not the same as random selection. Random selection means we randomly picked you out of a, out of a, a population, and now you're in the sample, and you were randomly picked to be in that sample. That's a good thing, right? But it's not the same as random assignment. Random assignment says it, that I am going to put you in either a treatment group or a non-treatment group, my experimental or my control group, if you will, based on the flip of a coin. So I will randomly put you into groups. In the real world, random assignment is often rather difficult to achieve because if you're thinking about education in classrooms, you can't say, okay, we're going to mix these kids up and just randomly, you're going to pull you out of this class and send you over here to get history lessons, and you guys are going to go over here and get history lessons from a different teaching format. Uh, most folks are a little uncomfortable with saying, hey, just randomly take a shot on my kid. Um, they're kind of you know, reluctant to uh, to sign up for that. So in the real world, that's sometimes hard to do. But to have a truly experimental design, that's really what you need is random assignment to groups. Other key characteristic of experimental design is that you manipulate the independent variable. So we are in this category of where we're manipulating something. Down one step, quasi-experimental designs. These are the real world designs where you can't make that random assignment to groups. So uh, this would be, you know, a classic example. This would be that the training where I said region one and region two. I got folks here and I got folks here, and I can't do it randomly for whatever reason. I can't say, you know, I'm going to just pick names out of a hat and send you to the, the new training or the old training. But I can do it by region one versus region two. I don't have random assignment. I am manipulating the independent variable because either they get the new training or the old training. And these are called quasi-experimental designs because I'm looking for differences across groups, but I don't have that random assignment. And that means I have to do, uh, I have to take things a little bit differently and do some of the, the some, uh, some additional work to, to try and control the fact that I couldn't just randomly assign people to groups. So they may be different at the outset. I may have a selection difference. I may have a context difference. Um, Many, many things can, can go on that become potential confounds. It's still a valid technique, and we'll talk about at length about how to manage uh, some of those confounds within a quasi-experimental design. Because uh, looking for differences between groups, most of what you're going to do is going to be quasi-experimental. The third type of design I have up here is correlational. Correlational um, designs, the independent variable and the dependent variable are measured at the same time and we're not manipulating the independent variable. It's usually an existing condition. So we try, we try and, uh, and then establish a relationship between the two. So <coughs> uh, I can try and figure out what it is that uh, makes someone a good leader, right? And so let's look at things about personality. We could take folks who are in leadership roles and who are viewed as good leaders, and we give them a personality test. Uh, actually, they're let, let me back up. Not that they're viewed as good leaders. We take people who are, you know, have been in a leadership role for anywhere from two to five years and say that's our target group. We're going to give them a personality test and um, ask them each to complete it. Well, now we're going to take uh, the evaluations of their supervisor and um, correlate those with the personality measures. Now, my independent variable, the thing that comes first, right, uh, or the, the precondition, is the, the personality dimensions. Which of those dimensions correlate most strongly with um, success as a manager? Okay? I'm measuring the independent variable and the dependent variable at the same time. My design, rationality, logic, tells me which, is, which one comes first and is the independent variable or the cause and which is the effect. Personality is fixed, you know, certainly before the age of 16, somewhere between the age of 5 and 16, it becomes fixed. So my independent variable is really um, the personality dimensions, and the dependent variable is whether or not that makes them a good manager, good leader. Um, so correlational design, we're, we're kind of measuring things at the same time. We can't manipulate anything. Personality is that existing condition, but we're still going to try and understand how that plays into or has an effect on the outcome we're looking for. Language usually changes here a little bit. 
and and in the language you would call the independent variable the the predictor and the uh, um, the dependent variable the criterion in in a lot of a lot of cases but the concepts the ideas are the same descriptive studies fourth design there uh, these are ones case study participant observations uh, things like that where you're really going for a richness of information and saying I'm going to take one or two people and walk through a case and try to understand what it is that made them a good leader right I'm going to interview you know people who have been very successful and you know that's what you see a lot in the in the bookstores is a lot of uh, rock star CEOs writing books or having case studies written about them and that takes me through one person and it has a richness and a depth of information I can also use observation I can use participant observation um, there are many diff different uh, techniques within this but really it's all about describing the conditions as I as I see them uh, for these particular individuals all right in a broad sense and this kind of falls into uh, uh, the same category as the the things above it kind of supports the the research designs above the approaches we have quantitative approach which is we're looking for features we can count um, a lot of statistics here this is numbers how do I do a survey how do I do a measure how do I do a personality test uh, that is going to give me a quantitative measure of some characteristics usually you're not able to do quantitative research until you understand an area or understand the construct so if I go back to the inductive deductive uh, research um, quantitative models you usually have to have some deduction in them because you have a theory that kind of says these are the things we want to measure this is what's important this is how it should be measured and how it makes the most sense where you get that information is from the qualitative research from those detailed descriptions um, in advance you may only kind of know what you're looking for uh, I'll go back to uh, my example of a client where with the new president and she's like well, tell me what's going on in my organization I know there's frustration well roughly we knew what we were looking for we didn't know specifically what we were looking for so uh, there the differences between these two kind of um, are in purpose in usage and in how you go about conducting the research so back to quantitative for a minute uh, data is numerical from questionnaires or equipment I mean you can have keystroke counts you can have uh, time to complete an ac activity um, you, if you look at uh, some some internet research what's your dropout rate on on purchases right um, so there is a numerical component to that on the qualitative side it's more in the form of words pictures pictures or objects and I'll, I'll just take a questionnaire and show you a difference between the two techniques I can form a questionnaire say a survey for for employees and I want to evaluate employee engagement and I can go to the theory and I can read read what's out there and I can put together 10 questions or 12 questions that say these really tap at tap into employee engagement right and I can put together a nice measure or use somebody else's and they'll give me a nice numerical answer part of that development I can also do what's called a cognitive interview and say okay take me through these questions and tell me what you think when you hear this question tell me how you're going to respond what is it that you're thinking about when you check strongly agree or strongly disagree now that data is in the form of words or pictures but it helps me understand what am I really measuring so I can get there to what am I really measuring by going to you know quanti uh, quantitative numbers detail specifics or I can go there a different way both are useful depending on where you are in the process um, let's see I'll let you read through the rest of those because uh, I think I've covered the the key points there so just remember that for all of these uh, uh, for both of these methods there's a place and a time and a setting for them and there's value in each of them and there's technique in each of them that you can do them well or you can do them poorly <laughs>